Hey everyone, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis, and today we have a very exciting episode uh, talking about cessationism. Uh, Dr. Tom Schreiner is with us. He is going to explain cessationism. We're going to turn it over to him uh, just here in one second. But before we do, I want to let you know who Remnant Radio is and what we're all about. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We uh, interview pastors and teachers from different churches and denominations on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. We discuss things like theology, church history, and the gifts of the Spirit. But we don't just do it with people within our own denomination. We actually go and interview Anglicans and Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians and Pentecostals and Charismatics, everyone under the Orthodox theology space. And we want to get their insight and their thoughts. So if you're interested in learning all the positions on uh, eschatology, soteriology, hamartiology, Remnant Radio is the channel for you. Make sure to hit subscribe so you get updated when we come out with content just like this. Sorry for the brief interruption. Michael, tell us uh, a little bit about what we have to look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, tomorrow we have a great show on, uh, it, it's in our, our segment called To Be Continued, which we have every Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m., uh, which is about the continuation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which today is the opposite of that. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. More on that in a moment. Uh, but but tomorrow we're going to specifically focus on what does it look like for us to have a Christ-centered approach to Spirit-empowered ministry. And uh, it, it's real easy to float away into charismatic la-la land, and a lot of you have experienced that or were concerned about that. What does it look like to make Christ the center? And so we're going to talk about that tomorrow. We have some upcoming shows next week. We have Matthew uh, Esquivel coming on to talk about four different views of communion. Uh, really good. He's He's got a, a strong focus. He's getting his PhD in church history. Uh, and then we have uh, Doug Wilson. I don't know if he's next week or the week after. Anyway, yeah. he's coming on the show talking about just war theory. Yeah, we so. might we might sneak in some theonomy there. Uh do some sneak just in war a little theory. theonomy we're gonna and just some, war. We're gonna do some fun stuff. It's going to be okay. really exciting. People are looking forward theonomy to Theonomy and war. Yeah, theonomy and war. Let's do it. You know how we do. All right. Uh, <laughs> without further ado, uh Dr. Schreiner, it, really excited to have you on. We both read your book uh, on the cessation of the gifts and it was such a fair and careful treatment. Uh we're, we're so thankful to have you on the show. Uh before we just dive into the subject matter, can you just introduce yourself to our audience? Tell them a little bit about yourself and your ministry before we dive into the subject matter? Sure. Um, so I teach at the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and I've been there since 1997. I pastored, uh, I was preaching pastor from 1998 through 2015 at Clifton Baptist. Before I um, was at Southern from 1986 to 1997. I taught at Bethel Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. And from 1983 to 1986, I taught at Azusa Pacific University in, uh, in Azusa, California, near Los Angeles. So yeah, it's been, it's been a great uh, privilege to be at these various schools and Where's the time gone? It's gone so fast. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Dr. Schreiner, it's a huge honor uh, to have you on the show. We're both uh, big fans of, uh, of your work, of your ministry. And so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, excited to talk about the cessation of the gifts. And you know, and our audience knows that we are both continuationists. You have been a continuationist at one point in your life. Currently, you are a cessationist and obviously written uh, a book about it and are, are firm in that belief. Uh, just want our audience to know, this is not a debate. This is not like right. Josh and Michael versus Dr. Schreiner. <laughs> Praise God, you'd probably rip us apart. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, it, in all honesty, this is a conversation. This is a conversation in-house between brothers in Christ, and we just want to get at truth. And, uh, and what does the Bible really say? And Dr. Schreiner, one of the things that I really appreciated uh, about your writing is, is how fair you are. And you mentioned that, Josh. One of the things you even said is, I might be wrong on this. Love that, uh, that humility that it's like, you don't think you're wrong, obviously. And, uh, but you, you have the humility to say, hey, you know, um, <laughs> I, I'm not omniscient here or whatever. So, so we really appreciate that. And uh, we, we felt like you didn't build straw men of continuationist arguments. And, uh, and so that, that all of these are reasons why we wanted to have you on the show. And I thought maybe it'd be good for us to begin with a little building of common ground. What do you see as common ground between cessationists and continuationists? What, uh, 
what do you see that we agree on and and maybe even how can we learn and grow from each other yeah well i i think i begin by saying and i know you michael and josh you'd agree with this that for those of us who are evangelicals right so our common ground is the, the, the belief in the inspired scriptures. The scriptures are our final authority. We believe uh, together as evangelicals that we're justified by faith alone. Uh, we believe in the substitutionary death of Christ. We believe in the Trinity. We believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man. I mean, we share, you know, I could go on and on. We we share this the most significant uh doctrinal uh, arenas uh, in, in, in common. So I, I think if the, I think there are some charismatics out there. I don't think it's because they're charismatic necessarily. I mean, that's an interesting question. There are charismatics out there who have bad doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. But there are non-charismatics that have bad doctrine. There are non-charismatics that deny the authority of Scripture and who are liberal about the person of Christ and, and so forth and so on. But the, the other thing I want to say, which is in my book, I have, I have many charismatic friends that fit within the boundaries I just talked about, and they have been a great blessing to me. And I have pastor, I've had, you know, John Piper was my pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, John, John and I don't have the same view on this, and uh, Wayne Grudem is one of my very dear friends. And I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about the orthodoxy of a John Piper or a Wayne Grudem. Or another good friend that I, you've probably had on your show is Sam Storms. Mm -hmm. Sam's a, a beloved friend. Um, I know C.J. Mahaney well. He's a, he's a friend that I love as well. So, I mean, obviously I could keep going. So there's many wonderful believers that we share so much in common uh, that, uh, but we might differ on th these issues. And I think, you know, that was, that was the idea behind T4G, right? Together for the gospel. And, um, and I think the gospel coalition as well. Mm -hmm. So I, at least the way I view evangelicalism, at least at its best, I think we've uh, emphasized our unity on these kind of things for for a long time. Amen. So. Amen. Okay, well, we'd, we'd love to just give you a chance and, and make your case for cessationism. What are your go-to arguments from the Scripture? What uh, your, your number one argument, number two? And, and we'd just love to give you an opportunity to build that case, much like you do in the book, uh, before we kind of jump in with a, a thousand different questions. Yeah, and just to, for our audience who, who's watching, and they're, like, they're expecting, like, hey, this is a debate, not a debate. This is an interview, right? We're yeah. asking uh, Dr. Schreiner. He's given us his time. We're just going to ask him for his position, and we'll, we will give pushback. Well, what about who, people who say this, or what about people who say that? And he can interact with that. We'll probably pull in some of your live questions that are coming through the chat, so feel free to ask those. Uh, but, but again, toss it back over to Dr. Schreiner. I don't want people getting to the end of this video before they figure out, wait, they're, they're not going to debate over this? Uh, uh, Dr. Schreiner, tell us a little bit uh, about that, your position on cessationism. Uh, your best arguments and how you would articulate to those uh, who may be in a continuation of space. Yeah. Well, one of the things I'd want to say right up front is um, I don't mind if people debate with me over it. I don't mind if I'm pressed hard. I, that's to me, that's fine. I mean, that's what it means to talk about these things. I mean, you guys have a great spirit about yourselves and uh, we shouldn't be shy about discussing uh, even passionately uh, on particular positions. So that, so I, I mean, those of you who are listening, any question you want to ask, I'm just wide open to that. Yeah, I, I, that, uh, that's one of the first things I'd want to say, which I've really already said, but I'd want to say again, I don't, I don't think, I don't think this is one of the clearest matters in the scripture. That's why I say I could be wrong. If I, if, if, I, if I felt more clarity, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that about the Trinity, right? Well, right. You know, I believe in the Trinity, but maybe, maybe it's wrong. I believe Jesus is God, but maybe I'm wrong. I wouldn't say that about that. But so uh, when I, so I became a Christian 
I grew up as a Roman Catholic, but I wasn't a believer as a Roman Catholic. I became a Christian when I was 17. I was introduced in the cessationist circles right away, basically. You know, I knew some charismatics, but basically I was introduced into cessationist circles. I was taught cessationism at um, the seminary I went to. But then, then when I, I went to Fuller Seminary, and Fuller Seminary is very diverse, ran into some, yeah, maybe, maybe that was my first experience. Uh, I mean, I don't remember exactly now, but maybe my first experience about meeting uh, nuanced, careful, biblical continuationists. So that was, that was significant to me. And then the same when I taught at Azusa, you know, I had, I had students who were continuationists and, and some uh, faculty that I taught with. And then, so I don't remember exactly when this happened, but when I was at, so I distinctly remember this, when I was at Azusa, I uh, checked out of the library, Wayne Grudem's book on prophecy. <laughs> and I was, this was just- It's this always was, the gateway drug. That's how we get them. <laughs> and, 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 and it was his dissertation. Okay. You know, not, not the book he published later with Crossway or whoever he published that with, but his dissertation. And I was blown away by that book. Hmm. I, I was, I, it, it was so well written, and I was, uh, I was convinced by him. And then I, I, in 1986, I moved to Bethlehem Baptist, and uh, John Piper was slowly becoming a continuationist. And I sat under his ministry, and John had a huge influence on me. And so, and then Wayne Grudem came and did a retreat, uh, or a, maybe not a retreat, a conference. And uh, so as somewhere in there, I became a continuationist and I started teaching and I read Showing the Spirit by Carson. That was another big thing, another yeah, big mm -hmm. thing. So all, all those things combined, the, I started teaching it in class. And, you know, I had continuationist students and, you know, <laughs> they would say, you know, because um, I'm laughing, so I'm smiling because now they'd be disappointed in me because they'd say in those days, oh, wow, this is awesome. So um, almost all scholars we ran into are cessationists and you're a continuationist and you encourage us. And so <laughs> I felt good about that. You know, I'd like, I like to hear them say that. And I would say, you know, I met, I, I just hung around with and met a lot of continuationists that weren't, I, I don't want to offend anybody, you know, but you, you know what I'm saying? They weren't crazy. Yeah, um, they're not all continuationists wear white suits and, you know, hit people with their coats. Right, right, saying. right. And, right. and <laughs> they were orthodox, they were normal, they were, uh, you know, all within the the uh, mainstream of evangelicalism. They were, they were intelligent, they knew their Bibles, and... Uh, they weren't. Uh, I I had I had some notions in my head that, you know, uh, that they everybody was a continuation. It was just kind of strange, but I I had numerous examples of the contrary. And then I was getting you know Carson Grudem, Piper, others. So I taught that for several years, and I went to you know uh, a number of charismatic meetings and uh, I became friends with a charismatic pastor. I preached in his church uh, more than once. And so all that, all that was to the good, but so I'm a, I, this is partially my personality, right? I, even this whole time I had some questions. I had, there were things that I wasn't, totally convinced of but and one of those things in the back of my mind was is Grudem right about prophecy and I had friends on the other side who were poking at me and saying Grudem's wrong on prophecy and um, so again I can't remember the whole process but slowly and this is this is my gateway to gateway say, back there, there was a gateway drug back to cessationism <laughs> back, back to cessationism 
I slowly began to doubt that Grudem was right on prophecy, which, you know, the, and he's not the only one that says this, obviously, but he made the most articulate case for me. And the, and the key was Grudem's argument that New Testament prophecy differs from Old Testament prophecy in that New Testament in New Testament prophets, their prophecies are mixed with errors and mistakes. And um, I felt, as I said, I taught that for a number of years and I was very comfortable with it. But um, what, why did I finally, you know, just to boil it down, so, so why did I begin to doubt that? First of all, I, I would just say several things. First, I think, I think the burden of proof is against Grudem, that the nature of the gift yeah. differs between the T Old Testament and the New Testament. So uh, th that, that was significant to me. Secondly, you know, I'll never forget when I first read Wayne's book, how impressed I was in 1 Corinthians 14, it relates to 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, 19 and following, but where, where, where he argues, look, you're not judging the prophets, you're judging the prophecies. And when I, and, and of course that could be true. He might be right there, but it struck me one day, wait a minute, there's no other way to assess whether a prophet is true or false, except for via the prophecies. So that's how they judge prophets in the old Testament. That's really not different to me. I, so that that argument that struck me as so convincing at first, well, they're not judging whether a prophet's true or false, Grudem said. They're just they're just judging whether there's some mistakes and sifting the prophecies. Is there mis are there some mistakes there? But it, but it be began to strike me. Uh, well, wait a minute. This how is this really different? They didn't, you know, as I said, they didn't they didn't look at Jeremiah's face or whoever the prophet is. They they had to. The only way to assess a prophet is by what they say. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was significant to me. Thirdly, I didn't think that there was any clear example in the New Testament of a prophet making a mistake. Now, you know, we you could we could we'll probably talk about Acts twenty one four. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I won't read that verse right now, but I'm sure you'll come back to it. You you know it well. Um but you know, Grudem's Grudem's key case is Agabus. You know, Agabus prophesied that the Jews would bind Paul in Acts and then hand him over to the Romans. And again, when I first read Grudem, I thought that was so fascinating because you know, that's not what happened at all. Yes, yes, Paul ends up in the hands of the Romans. That part of the prophecy is true. But he wasn't bound, uh, for, for those who are listening, you know the story, right? The story, the story instead is that they were beating Paul. They were pounding on him, the Jews were, that is. And the, the Roman Tribune came and rescued him. So the Jews hardly bound Paul and handed him over to the Romans. And so, you know, it looked like a classic case of uh, supporting Grudem's view that New Testament prophecies are mixed with an air. But I, but as, as I looked at this, I was very struck by what Paul says in Acts 28, verse 17, when he goes to Jerusalem and he describes to the Jews in Jerusalem what happened to him. And Paul uses the very verb that Agabus used, paradidomi, which means to hand over. And he says, I was handed over. Uh, uh, I was delivered over. So it struck me that, no, Paul, Paul, even in recording that account, he records that account in, in, in such a way that he he. He reads the part that Grudem actually thinks was a mistake. Paul reads that part as accurate and true. He he was mm -hmm. he was uh, he was handed over, and and that relates to my fourth point. And my fourth point is, 
I think actually when it comes to that, that the kind of precision that Grudem demands of, in terms of prophecy, that kind of precision would lead us to a view of inerrancy. I'm a strong inerrantist and, and Wayne is a super duper strong inerrantist. But I think it would lead us to a view of inerrancy that's t more precise than is warranted. Mm -hmm. In other words, when, when you're an inerrantist, you have to be careful that inerrancy is defined in terms of the way scripture uh, functions. And uh, my, my, example, my example here is the, you know, the two stories of the centurion in Matthew and Luke, right? In, in, in Matthew, the centurion talks directly to Jesus and Luke, he never does. There's intermediaries, but Matthew's not wrong. He just scrunches up the story, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to keep that in mind. My, I'm almost done because you guys want to talk, right? No, you my, get fifth, <laughs> my, fifth, my fifth point is I don't think continuationists have, or, or at least un, talk enough about the danger that is often mentioned by Jesus, by, by John, 1 John 4, by Peter and 2 Peter 2, the danger of false prophets. And as I think I say in my books, I think it's a little bit of a nightmare to try and discern who the false prophets are if prophecies are mixed with heirs. Mm. Uh, I mean, then, then you have to begin with maybe a lot of qualifications. Well, prophets can make minor heirs, uh, but can they make doctrinal heirs? And on and on it goes. And I think, I think that's a very difficult scenario. So that's that. So then, um, I mean, why would that lead me to be a cessationist? Because for me, I would say there's no clear verse, and I'm the first to say this, there's no clear verse that establishes cessationism. And honestly, 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sure we'll talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think you could say from 1 Corinthians 13 that cessationism is um, less plausible than continuationism. And I'm happy to say, well, I think that's a great argument, and, and, and that's why I'm, I'm happy to say maybe that's even true. Maybe, maybe that's wrong. But then, then I'd want to say, well, when it comes to cessationism, for me, I feel sure there's not apostles and prophets. And Paul says, so my, my verse in is not 1 Corinthians 13. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Uh, mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.20. Yeah, Ephesians 2.20. Uh, I said Acts yeah. 2. Ephesians 2. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Ephesians 2.20. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Those, that foundation has been laid. By the way, those prophets are clearly New Testament prophets. Virtually all exegetes agree on that. Uh, so that foundation has been laid. We don't need apostles anymore, and there aren't apostles anymore, and there aren't prophets. Uh, because to have such would threaten, would threaten and impinge on our final revelation. Now, I'm just speaking academically here. Mm -hmm. In a way, after that, I don't care in a way about the other gifts, if, if you know what I'm meaning, for the sake of this debate. I think that there can be miracles, there can be healings, there can be speaking in tongues. I do have questions about those gifts, though, because I... Because first of all, I think God still does miracles and heals today. Mm -hmm. My question, my question is, at least my doubt, I'm skeptical about whether people actually have those as gifts that they regularly exercise. But maybe they do. I mean, I, I still feel like to me, my position on that is somewhat somewhat just open to further experience and so forth and so on. Because, yeah. because miracles and healings just don't matter to me as much because they're not threatening further, they're, they're, there's not in any further revelation there. Tongues, it just depends on what you do with that. And um, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting discussion as well. Mm -hmm. um, again, it depends on how you understand the gift of tongues. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I could say other things, but... But um, maybe I'll say one other thing, because this always gets people going who, do, who don't agree with me. So, 
<laughs> He's like, I'm going to prod you. Just a heads up. Here it comes. Uh, so I don't think... So I, I actually think Wayne Grudem and I aren't very far apart. Yeah. Because what he calls prophecy... I just think that's the wrong word for it. I you call, call it, it providence. You call it impressions. Impressions. Sure. You know, Jonathan Edwards would agree with me. He was a cessationist, but Jonathan Edwards believed in impressions. God, uh, C.H. Spurgeon believed in impressions. I mean, C.H. Spurgeon was preaching, right? You know the story. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys mm-hmm. know the story. Oh, yeah. What this guy who stole gloves or whatever it was was sitting up in the balcony, and he knew it. But C.H. Spurgeon didn't believe he had the gift of prophecy. And uh, an impression was put on his heart. And I think, so impressions can be true or false, right? So just what Grudem says about prophecy. But I don't think prophecy can be true or false, but impressions can be. So that's why Edwards, I think, wisely said, yes, God can use impressions, but be careful. Don't don't base your whole life on impressions because they can be, you know, as Edward said, they can be like the jack-o'-lantern impressions. They can be very, it's hard to say. Um, but but here, you know what a lot of people say to me when I bring up impressions, they say, well, you've got this category that's not in the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. You believe in impressions, but they're not in the Bible. And I would say, well, they're not called impressions, but they are in the Bible. Um Paul, Paul thought he should go up uh, into, uh, what is it, Misa in Acts 16, and the Spirit told him not to. Mm-hmm. Um, Acts 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse um, 11 or 12, Paul said to Apollos, so this, I think this is a fascinating story. Paul said to Apollos, I really want you to go to Corinth. And Apollos said, what would you say if the Apostle Paul told you to go somewhere? I really want you to go to a Corinth, Apollos. And Apollos said, I don't think so. I don't think I should go right now. And Paul doesn't come back and say, you're disobeying God's will. He mm-hmm. says, he'll come when he can. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. so I love it a number of levels because, you know, people are so used to Paul being authoritative. But I think Paul left a lot of things to people's individual conscience. And I think Paul respected and honored what God was impressing on Apollos. So it was impressed on Paul. Apollos should go to Corinth. But it, w- Apollos didn't share that impression. And Paul didn't think, say, well, then, hey, man, that was a prophecy of God. You got to do it. He said, mm-hmm. okay, come when you can. We, yeah. we, we trust God's leading you. So that, that's lots of things I said and... Well, I, I know Michael has a question. I just I want to really briefly just like double down on this specific thing that you just brought up is that there is just not really when, when we're talking about careful, thoughtful, theological, continuationist and cessationist, there's really not that much difference. And even hearing you like like the way that we would talk about prophecy and we would use the word prophecy for it, uh, you're saying that's an impression and you're willing to admit that this could be wrong and I'm willing to admit that that's going to that could be wrong. Um, you know, I think RC Sproul tells a story about how, you know, he's driving a car and or it might have been an illustration, it might not have been an actual story. And it just feels this inclination to turn right. Okay, and he turns right. And there's a big car crash in front of him. You can see that's providence, right? Every charismatic in the world goes, that was prophecy, right? Like, don't, you no, know, that's what that was. So it really comes down to semantics in a lot of these cases, like whether it's the gift of healing or God does a miracle of healing. Uh, you know, we, we as continuationists believe the gift of healing is not uh, an on-command gift that we can wield at our own will but some, something that God does uh, occasionally through God's people, right? And that's the gift of healing. Uh, my, my 1689 London Baptist Confession brothers would be like, no, well, that's a miracle of healing that God can do at his leisure, but it's not the gift of healing because it's not something someone is able to maintain and control. So this is just a really important thing. And I, I really hope that we can, you know, in this episode, build a lot of bridges because when we think cessationist, some people think of this character of cessationist. And I remember hearing growing up in, in the churches I was raised in is cessationists don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in any, they made cessationists out to be like these deists who believe that God spun the world into existence and just like stepped away after the crucifixion. Like he doesn't do anything supernatural ever. Uh, and that's just not the normative cessationist as far as I'm concerned or as or aware. Uh, and I think, I hope, 
I do feel a great resurgence back to, because of the abuses that you just mentioned in the charismatic community, that people are really trying to figure out what theologically do we believe about these things. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, those lines get closer and closer together. But Michael has a question. I'm, I'm going to toss it over to him. Oh, sure. Thanks for that, Josh. And, uh, but, and, and I think even to follow up to what you just said is I, I do think there's a lot of common ground, and I think a lot of it comes down to semantics, and I think it's important that you said what you said. But it's also important that we come to truth on this because the difference in how we identify something with vocabulary, if I label it prophecy, I'm going to eagerly desire and pursue it and organize my church in such a way that prophecy is prioritized. But if someone else calls it an impression, they're probably not going to take that approach. They're not going to in any way organize their church around receiving impressions. There's going to be a less zealous pursuit of it. So on, on one hand, we can find some common ground yep. and we can stop building straw men as continuationists. Straw men of the cessationist argument is though they believe God's a deist. That's a fallacy. They're not, yep. They don't say that. Um, but it does really matter that we decide this. I think the stakes are big because we all want to obey the scripture. And um, uh, Dr. Schreiner, there's a number of points w- w- we're going to want to hit on. I have written down just some notes of what you said. We're definitely going to want to hit on Ephesians 2.20, I think, uh, and you call this the foundational argument for cessationists. No pun intended, since it does have a foundation in there. Um, we want to talk about um, uh, criteria for judging a prophet. If you can't judge a prophet by his prophecies, what else do you judge him by? Acts 21 is going to be an important one for us, 1 Corinthians 13, and then I think coming back to that word impressions, and some of this might bleed together. Those are a few of my notes, but um, uh, why don't we dive in, because this was the, the last thing that you were, you were uh, touching on, uh, w- was the idea of this difference between impression and prophecy, uh, whereas in your view, prophecy is authoritative. There is a, a total continuation between Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, you know, if Isaiah tells you what to do and says, thus says the Lord, you better do it. Um, and and you say that the burden of proof would be on the continuationist to say, hey, uh, this is changed now. And, uh, and within that framework, we come to Acts chapter 21. And, uh, and Dr. Schreiner, uh, I actually agree with you on this uh, with regard to Agabus. W- was Agabus right? Uh, or was Agabus wrong whenever he said that you know the Jews would hand them over and and, and I would agree with you that there's uh, it, it would require a, a degree of wooden literalism that is so wooden that we would then have to not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture if we held to that same standard. I agree with your argument and I especially like the way in your book I can't remember if you said it verbally too um, the the way you cross referenced with later in the book of Acts where uh, the the apostle Paul uh, seems to have no problem with uh, with the same sort of uh, wording applied anyway uh, you 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 alluded later in, in the book of Acts and I can't remember it I'm, I'm, I lost Acts the verse on me 17 yeah there it is anyway um so I agree with your argument on that. For me, and I'll speak as a continuationist, for me, the biggest issue is on Acts 21.4. Uh, it's, it's not what Agabus says. Uh, because on Acts 21.4, and I, and I just want to hear your thoughts on this, because I know uh, in your book you, you talk about, it, it, if, I, if I read you right, you would classify this as an impression, but not a prophecy, and that it was an impression that they got wrong. And the exact wording, and feel free to correct me if I misunderstood you uh, or uh, recited that wrong, but the verse says, And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Okay, and so as a continuationist, I would say, They prophesied, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. What I hear you saying is, well, they didn't prophesy it. uh, There's no prophecy involved here. They just got an impression. But it sounds like because of the wording where it says through the Spirit, they said, don't go to Jerusalem, that they were actually prophesying, don't go to Jerusalem, because that seems to be Luke's language for prophecy. And we know from the way the story plays out and has played out, I think it's both Acts 19 and Acts 20, the Apostle Paul has been compelled by the Spirit 
to go to Jerusalem, and he knows he's going to go there and suffer and so on. And so as a continuationist, I would come to this passage and say, Paul has already been told twice by the Holy Spirit, I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. And the way the story plays out in the end, it's clear that this was a providential arrangement that Paul was supposed to go. And now through the Spirit, they're saying, don't go. So as a continuationist, I say, well, they got their prophecy wrong. They got the revelation right, but they got the prophecy wrong. You say, well, that wasn't a prophecy. That was an impression. But um, but is that a stretch there? And, and I want to ask you that. Do you feel... How would you defend that if a continuationist says that's a stretch to say that they weren't prophesying? And one more thing on on Acts 21, they conclude at the very end whenever the Apostle Paul says, um, I'm going to Jerusalem, stop weeping and breaking my heart. It says, we concluded in the end, the Lord's will be done. And, And it would seem, as a continuationist, okay, I would argue this is the kind of this is the kind of response we would expect if prophecy has less authority uh, than it would if Isaiah said, thus says the Lord in the Old Testament. Um, y- you know, if Isaiah says that in the, in the Old Testament, you better do what he says. But here, Paul feels a freedom to actually not do what prophetic people have said to not do. And so it, I'm putting all of that into one big question. <laughs> but I know yeah, you're very yeah. familiar with the argument, so I... I, I confident you can <laughs> you can respond to that no that that's really an excellent excellent question and you formulated it very well i so i yeah i would say several things first of all the that is the hardest verse for me there's no doubt about that that's the first thing i'd say second thing i'd say is when when we come to defining prophecy or I just want to be careful about camping down on that verse. We've got we've got the whole of biblical revelation that says when 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 the spirit speaks through people, it's true. So I think um, you know, to me, the camping on this verse is a little bit like uh, camping on the verse Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour of the second coming, and using that. Okay, I'm going to use that as a, the fundamental verse for my Christology. Now, I, I don't think the answer to that verse is so difficult about Jesus not doing the day or the hour. But my, my point is, every doctrine, every doctrine we have, there are problems, right? There are verses that aren't so clear. So, yes, I am, I am quick to say that verse is harder for my understanding. And, uh, but... But when I look at the whole of what Scripture teaches, those who prophesy, true prophets, prophesy without error. And when I see Agabus doesn't make a mistake, and I'm left only with this one verse that could be interpreted that way, that I'm I'm not greatly troubled by it. Thirdly, actually, I don't say what you say. I do not argue that in this verse, this is an impression. Okay. Instead, what I argue is this is truly a prophecy. They are prophesying through the Spirit, which actually makes it more difficult than seeing it just as an impression, right? Okay. Because <laughs> I, because I, because I think that would more neatly fit Grudem's view. So you know they're prophesying through the Spirit, and yet, and yet they're, uh, yeah, as you pointed out very well, Paul is led by the Spirit, and Paul makes it very clear. Look. Look, guys and gals, uh, the Spirit told me to do this. Uh, cut it out! <laughs> You're breaking my heart. Uh, I'm go- I'm going. So, so uh, how do I handle this verse if I think there's a prophecy? Here, I agree with a number of interpreters that what's happened. Now, now you know, you got to hear me really carefully here, mm-hmm. and I don't expect you to agree with me. But I agree with those who say, what is Luke actually doing here? Well, what, what's going on in this chapter? Luke is not trying to unpack for us the nature of prophecy. He's not, that's not what he's trying to do. He's telling us a story about how Paul ends up in, in Jerusalem and in Rome. That's where the last part of Acts is going. So what, what happens in this verse is is Luke merges together 
both the prophecy and the conclusion they drew from the prophecy. He does not neatly distinguish them. But um, I agree with C.K. Barrett. C.K. Barrett says you could look at this and think what, what you could draw two conclusions. By, by the way, C.K. Barrett wrote the ICC commentary on Acts. He's not an evangelical, by the way. C.K. Barrett believed there are heirs in the Bible. But, mm -hmm. but he does say about this verse, he says, okay, um, either, either, uh, either the, prophets, the prophets were wrong or, um, or uh, you, have, you have something else going on here. But he says, for Luke, for Luke, it is impossible to think that he thought somebody who prophesied through the Spirit made a mistake. So my argument is, just to be clear, my argument is that Luke has mushed together both the prophecy and the conclusion they drew from it. And, but actually, they're distinct. They're, the conclusion, the prophecy was, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to suffer. That was absolutely true. Not, they don't say something to Paul through the Spirit that's wrong. And I think that's a, still a problem with the continuationist view. So they said something through the Spirit that was actually a mistake, an error. I, as Barrett says, for Luke to think that, he thinks is impossible. And I think that too. But Luke merges them together because he's in a hurry to tell the story. And we already know from all the Bible that no prophecy is ever wrong. So that's that's my best attempt. And it doesn't satisfy everyone, maybe because of my own social location and study of this. I feel like that answer is totally right. But OK. All right. Um, and then what would you make you and you guys? Can yeah, no, no, that's that's yeah. great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to ask a follow up at the, at the very. OK, so at the very end, Whenever Paul concludes, you know, I'm uh, Paul says I'm going anyway, and I don't care what you say. How how do you process that? What's happening there? It, do, does that in any way suggest a lower view of the authority of prophecy, or are you saying, well, he's only responding to their emotional, personal appeals? He's not responding to their prophecy. Like how how do you process that? He's not responding to the prophecy because the prophecy said you're going to suffer. He's responding to the conclusion they drew from the prophecy, which Luke merges together, as I said. So the mm -hmm. con so you're going the spirit says you're going to suffer. Then they said, "Don't go." And Paul says, uh, "You know, the conclusion you drew from that prophecy is wrong. It makes perfect sense." So mm -hmm. I don't see any tension there. Naturally, humanly, they love Paul. They didn't want him to go. And Paul just said to him, guys, gals, this is not the will of God. I, I love you too, but God right. told me to go. The Spirit told me to go. So okay. I, would argue, I would argue Do, both in the here? case of the prophets oh, that's my idea. and in the case of Paul, the Spirit didn't make a mistake. So, yeah. which is actually how I'd handle an issue of an inerrancy in other cases, right? Okay. People can say, oh, well, did Judas was, did Judas's was Judas hanged or did his middle split open? No, actually, when, when, we, when we look at it, both are actually true when we carefully look at it. And I, I'd say I think this is a case like that. It isn't, you know, whether Judas was hanged or he's, his middle split open, it's not immediately apparent upon reading the story. Okay. But when we probe into it more, there's a plausible solution. That's my argument. Okay, cool. Yep. And, and just for our viewers, so so that you can understand the two different views, for you, what you need to decide if you're deciding on this issue is what does Paul mean by, or, or sorry, Luke, what does Luke mean when he records through the Spirit they said don't go to Jerusalem? For the continuationist, the continuationist is going to say through the Spirit is Luke's language for they were prophesying. And they were prophesying, don't go to Jerusalem, but they mixed in some, some personal uh, feelings there. The cessationist perspective that uh, Dr. Schreiner has just articulated is he has said that Luke is sort of using shorthand to, to essentially, and feel free to correct me, Dr. Schreiner, to essentially um, 
get to the point quickly. To He's mushing together, I think, is what you said. The content of the actual prophecy, which was you'll suffer in Jerusalem, which was entirely accurate because the Spirit only says accurate things. And then Luke just kind of brought in, mushed in the conclusion to kind of get to his point. And so the, you just have to decide what you think between those two. Dr. Schreiner, did I articulate what you said correctly? That was great. That was fantastic. Okay, uh, Josh. You Excellent. We're we're at like forty minutes, and uh, we've gotten uh, we have a lot we, more. We, we got to talk one about. question the, uh, out of the way on on Acts chapter twenty, but we did get the intro intro on on what is cessationism, so that's that's helpful. Uh, when, when talking about this subject, um, there are various continuationists, right? So it's not like Grudem is like the the standard of all continuationists everywhere, people who are coming on from the cessationist persuasion going, okay, uh, is that the only position? There are guys like Keener who would say that there are there's more continuity between the Old Testament and New Testament prophecy, and they would actually kind of hold the position that says that, hey, the, 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 the speech that the person heard was... Uh, was right. They, 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 they heard God's word, but then they, then they interpreted that word incorrectly. Uh, a good example would be, I believe it's 1 Samuel chapter 3, where uh, Samuel hears the word of the Lord calling him, and he goes to his father Eli. And Eli goes, hey, go back to bed. And this process repeats three different times. There was a word that came to Samuel that he heard, and it was God, but he interpreted that word incorrectly. Right? He didn't understand what was being said. Um, in, in the same kind of vein, there, there's a passage in Numbers, uh, you know, Numbers, what is it, Numbers 12, 7 through 9, that talks about God speaking in riddles and in dark sayings. In the passage in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 13 and 9 through 12, that talks about prophesying through a mirror darkly. I think that's the right verse. 13 doesn't sound right, Michael. Is that right? Prophesying, prophesying in part, knowing in part. 1 yeah, Corinthians yeah. 13. 13. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Once I said it, I was like, "That's the love chapter." And we do anyway. So sometimes uh, I get my uh, my addresses wrong. Michael's kind of the address king. Uh, I I just wanted to know from your perspective with some of these verses, how would how would you uh, uh, respond to a, a continuationist that says, "Hey, uh, there are people in both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, maybe like Nathan, who who uh, seating in, in in the position of a prophet speaks to David, go and build that temple, goes home and sleeps on it, and goes <laughs> second thought, David." Don't build the temple. Um, yeah, were, the, were, those, were those kinds of? Is that what you're looking at? Uh, um, there, those kinds of interactions where some continuationists say, "Hey, there are different levels that are called prophecy: uh, dreams, uh, visions, riddles, dark sayings, prophesying in part." Uh, it seems as if Joel classifies uh, in, in Acts chapter 2 and in Joel 2 that the uh, outpouring of the Spirit on all flesh, sons and daughters will prophesy. It talks about dreams and visions, and then the response is tongues in, in Acts 2, and he says, this is what you're hearing about. So all three of those seem to be categorized somehow in a prophetic sort of way. Um, how, how would you, re- again, respond to those who are saying, uh, it's not always clear what God is saying, even when he's speaking to his people. Uh, would you just, uh, I don't know, I'll let you unpack that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, those those, those are those are fascinating. Very, those are interesting, fascinating to hear. I, I would my response would be First Samuel three. I don't think there's any indication there. I mean, Samuel wasn't prophesying; he was hearing God's word for the first time. He wasn't he wasn't declaring a word of God that he made a mistake. So, to me, that's. Oh, that's, that's not so much uh, a mistake, and I wouldn't say he made a mistake as much as it is he heard the word of the Lord and did not know how to apply it, uh, and that, that there are people, yeah, yeah. But it's not a, it's just not an example to me of a, of someone having a prophetic word and uh, mixing it with air. Uh, he's not declaring anything to anyone. He, he's just asking Eli if that's his voice. So... You know, I mean, the very text says God let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. I actually think Samuel's a strong example of the other. None of his words. Oh, that's right. Fall yeah. To the ground. Um, yeah. You know, Numbers twelve and related to First Corinthians thirteen. Well, again, I would just say I don't think there's any example there of error. Uh, there, I think the only point is some prophets get. Uh, more depth of interpretation. I'm obviously God revealed a lot more to Moses than He revealed to others, and uh, so there the the quality of the relationship was was better. 
But but I think that'd be quite a stretch to say, well, those things that are in riddles could be could be mixed with air. So uh, to me, that's a different category. So that that doesn't persuade me. And yeah, I think there is examples in the Bible. Nathan, Jeremiah is another where uh, they're not prophesying. So when, you know, when Hananiah first, you know, here's another example that's similar to the Nathan. Hananiah says, after Jeremiah prophesies, Hanan, Hananiah uh, says, hey, we're going to come back to Babylon, what, in two years or whatever it says. And and Jeremiah goes, fantastic, I hope so, or something like that, or may the Lord fulfill it, or whatever he says. But then he goes home, and the Lord then the Lord comes upon him in the prophetic spirit, and he speaks God's word. So I don't, I don't interpret, I can understand why some do, but I don't interpret what Nathan says or what Jeremiah says on that occasion is them prophesying. I don't think it's the case that everything prophets said, they always have the pr prophetic spirit upon them. I, I, I don't even know, you know, in those cases, what I say, they made a mistake even, you know, to me, did Jeremiah make a mistake when he said that? I, th I think it was clear, though, the way the story is told in Jeremiah and with Nathan, that they weren't they're just responding in a situation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I could see some would think that's a mistake. Um, that is, those don't seem like strong arguments to me, but yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I guess we all would judge those things differently. <laughs> sure. to, okay. To, to me, you know, still the clear clarity, I don't know what it, I don't know how that fits with Deuteronomy 18, that you could be a prophet and have heirs. And I think that'd be mm -hmm. particularly problematic with Jeremiah, who's under such pressure politically to get things right. But when he says that to Hananiah, I think everybody understood though that Han that you know it's he's in the situation and somebody prophesies we're going to come back from Babylon. And I think Jeremiah's first response was. I don't think he has his prophetic hat on every moment. He's like, great. I hope so. <laughs> mm. That would that that'd be wonderful. So, yeah. but then the Lord comes on him and he says, "Yeah, well, it's very interesting, right?" The Lord comes on him and uh, he says, "No, this is absolutely wrong." And here's the proof. I think the proof, Jeremiah twenty-eight, is Hananiah is going to die, and he dies that very year, right? So, to me, that story is wow. Uh, Jeremiah shows when he's prophesying, he doesn't get it wrong. He says, Ananias is going to die, and boom, his life's over. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to come back, sticking with the subject of prophecy, to uh, uh, one of your major points, which, which is that you, you mentioned Grudem saying, hey, 1 Corinthians 14, they're not judging the prophet, they're judging the prophecy. And you kind of had a change on that, and you said, wait a minute. How is there any other way to judge them than by their prophecies, whether they're true or false prophet? And uh, and you kind of go back to the Old Testament for that, and just and you say that we, we should expect that uh, that to continue. Um, so I, I want to know what you would say to this. So let's take the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, Matthew chapter seven. Uh, and Jesus says, "Beware of false prophets; they come to you as wolves in sheep's clothing." So he characterizes a false prophet as an unbeliever posing as though he is a believer. And, and so he's pointing to, uh, in, in the passage, he points to their fruit, and a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And in, and in context, he's talking about the fruit of their lives. Are these wicked people, or are they righteous people? Are these believers or non-believers? And, and you pay attention by, by seeing their fruit. And I can read the passage if you want. Okay. I know you're familiar with it. But... Yeah. Um, Anyway, what would you say if somebody says, actually, the New Testament does give us a, a way to assess one, whether one is a true or a false prophet, and the, the criteria that Jesus gives us is, uh, is the character of their lives. Now, dovetailing that into a conversation about 1 Corinthians chapter 14, um, we don't see the sort of things like what we see, say, in Deuteronomy 13 or 18, uh, in, in the way a, a false prophet is treated uh, in those passages, and we've had a lot of conversations on the show about Deuteronomy 18, so I don't want to get too sidetracked there. Um, 
but but we don't see, um, I mean, certainly not stoning, but that's not a New Testament thing anyway. Um, we don't even see excommunication. And, and the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, he's not a stranger to talking about excommunication in the very same letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Excommunicate this guy who's, you know, in, in sexually immoral behavior. Uh, and, and then in the same letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll talk about people who are getting sick and dying because they're taking the Lord's Supper uh, in, the, in an inappropriate way. Um, what would you say if somebody said, you know what, it, it would sure seem strange for the Apostle Paul if this is what he really believed, that these are false prophets in the church, that he, and he's in a, in a chapter talking about order in the church, it would sure seem strange if he's not going to at least mention excommunication or how you deal with this person. He simply says to weigh, see if it's true or false. And, and, and this all kind of fitting back with the Matthew 7 conversation seems to be this difference where uh, a, a true prophet, a, a false prophet is not one who misses a prophecy, just like if you know, somebody makes a mistake. You, you talk about you. You changed what you teach on this very issue. Didn't didn't make you like a false teacher at one point, right? Like, um, and so we might say, if missing a prophecy doesn't make one a false prophet, and uh, what makes one a false prophet is that they're an unbeliever, because this is the way false prophet is used throughout the New Testament. And what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians 14 is, is he is giving us a criteria for weighing prophecy, not determining whether one is a true or a false prophet. Um, I said a lot. I'm going to let you talk now. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yes, yes. I, I mean, the first thing you said, I think that's true, and that's helpful. Clearly, Jesus... And then we have other passages like this as well, that we can discern whether someone is a true believer. I guess I guess we would say from Matthew 7, at least God will discern on the final day, whether some who prophesied, cast out demons, did miracles, whether some of those are false teachers and false prophets. And uh, when I say, how else would we know, I didn't, I, I, I'm not excluding that thought. I, I mean, I, of course, I think that's true as well. We have a lot of scriptures mm -hmm. yeah. in that regard. So I, I accept that, yes, that's, that's a very fundamental characteristic of uh, what it means to be a believer. And it's so important, and I think we agree on that, that that's, that is uh absolutely foundational but so that to, to say that but but secondly i would just want to say uh, however when it comes to first corinthians 14 first thessalonians 5 there there paul is not asking when he's saying i don't think he's saying judge judge the prophets in this context i mean cer certainly it's true judge prophets by their lives but I don't mm -hmm. think that's what Paul's saying there. Mm -hmm. There, I do think he's saying, judge them by their utterances. So is the other, is what you're saying true? Absolutely. You, so you could, you could prophesy, say everything that's true, but if you're living a, a, a double life, uh, that's, that's a huge problem. But still, mm -hmm. I want to double down on what the text says. Mm -hmm. the, prophet, the prophet is assessed by the prophecies. Because uh, after all, that's that's what a prophet does. They proclaim what the Lord says, and so to Paul, what the what is said is very important, and it must be assessed. So why doesn't he say what? It, why doesn't he talk about discipline or speak more about uh, the, the consequences that should be raised? And my answer to that is. With all, I mean, I respect and honor what your question, and I think it's good, and I, I think it's a good point, and I, I just want to say though, I don't think we can demand things of texts. I mean, I get into this with my view of the warning passages in Hebrews six. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. I disagree with almost everybody on it. It seems like, but um, I think people demand things of texts that. Texts don't necessarily provide. Uh, so, 
very it not Paul doesn't every time he talks about serious defections, he doesn't immediately bring up church discipline. Mm -hmm. Yes, he will talk about church discipline, but he doesn't always bring it up. These letters we we have to recognize the letters and the books we have, I mean, in one way, they're very brief. And they give us instruction on truth. But we can't demand something like, well, if this was so important, why wouldn't he mention discipline? We have to look at all of Scripture to mm -hmm. decide what to do. I mean, John mentions the danger of false prophets oh, yeah. uh, in First John 4. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I could bring that text in, and I think it fits. Even John, John doesn't actually mention church discipline, but clearly he views it as a very serious problem. And those who prophesy falsely, he thinks are ultimately false teachers and false prophets. So I, just, I would just say to that, I, yeah, that's a very good point. And I want to say again, yes, maybe, I mean, I have so much respect for Wayne. Maybe Wayne and you are right on that text. I, that's what I want to say. Maybe you're right. I think, I think not, but <laughs> I'm all, I, that's why yeah, for me, my stance on that is I love my charismatic brothers and sisters <laughs> who, see, who see it differently from me. And I really, I feel that push, but I'm not brought over the line, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. No, that's and, good. and we've got, we've got so many more questions for you that we really want to ask. I'd love to have you on, on a part two, because I feel like we just scratched the, sur the surface because you've given us really thorough answers to our questions. I've got uh, one in other words, right? Oh no, no, I, no! I think I think that your 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 answers are are thorough, and I, that's what we want. Like we don't, I, I wouldn't want you to come on and meat, give me yeah. like a little snapshot of your point that we can like later pick apart and go, oh look, this is what we disagree with. Uh, if you really take your time to unpack these, I think it'll give our audience a better understanding of why why are they cessationists and and what do they believe? Because because we can kind of get into these little echo chambers where cessationists are like, why do continuationists believe this? There's not a shred of evidence, and then you have continuationists are like, why do cessationists believe? that there's not a shred of evidence right it has a lot to do with our hermeneutic and how we're coming to these mm -hmm. uh and i think that your uh, explanations help quite quite well uh, i have a question um so so for me uh i look at ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 talk about the foundation of the apostles and prophets um talking about prophecy is and, and i think that you've i, I don't want to misquote you and maybe i'll just kind of toss it over to you uh, but that prophecy is is always in the new testament uh, like a foundational work of of prophets, when prof prophets are prophesying, they are laying the foundation of the church. Is that correct? Like, how would how would you articulate that first? Yeah. Well, I mean, one one other thing I'd want to say is I don't. So we'd have to look at it case by case, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think in every case where you have the word prophetia or prophetuo, that we're always talking about the spiritual gift. Okay. So I, okay. so like in Revelation, I'm doing a commentary on Revelation right now. I think when the author of Revelation is using the words prophecy and prophesy, he means proclaiming God's word. No. And, but he's not thinking of the spiritual gift that Paul's talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just would want to say that we always have to look at a particular text. But yes, when the spiritual gift is in mind, God God uses that, that spiritual gift of prophecy. He uses it as uh, part of the foundation for the for the 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 doctrine and the life of the church as it's okay. established. Yeah, and and, and that, that that that's what I I wanted to make sure before I even asked my question how you would articulate it. So. So in, in Joel 2, Acts 2, where it talks about his spirit being poured out on all flesh, sons and daughters would prophesy. Um, it, my understanding would then be, I think then a cessationist understanding would be um, that women and children were laying doctrinal foundations for the early church. And, and as a complementarian, that's hard for me to, to grasp the connection, um, as, as I don't believe that women are supposed to teach or exercise authority. And yet, if according to Joel 2 and Acts 2, um, it, it seems as if they're laying doctrinal foundations for the New Testament church. So I, I have a hard time comprehending how—so so in my mind, I, I go New Testament prophecy, 
uh, is not uh, uh, authoritative by, again, laymen. Now, now, is there an office of a prophet and an office of an apostle? And, and when they are prophesying and when they are letting the foundation, maybe, right? I, I would go, okay, that, that kind of makes more sense when the apostle John you know, you call him the revelator, right? He has this revelation, right? That's a doctrinal foundation. Absolutely. Uh, those those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I could see that having John, or not John, Peter, seeing the the pigs in the blanket coming down from heaven, right? That that can be that can be doctrinal and foundational. Sure, I, I could see that. Absolutely. Uh, but when Agabus's daughters are prophesying or or the passages oh, we don't have in Philip's scripture daughter, yeah. or the stories that we don't have in scripture. I said, Philip's daughters. I'm getting all kinds of tongue tied today with, uh, with my stuff. Uh, but, but with women and children prophesying, how, how, how do you understand that they laid the foundation of the New Testament? I, I gather that you are a, a complementarian. Is that correct? That's right. That's so, right. So, so how would you, how would you reconcile those things? Yes. Well, first of all, I, I think I think it would be right probably to use the word office with apostle. I don't see the spiritual gift of prophecy as being an office. Okay. And I do see the gift as functioning differently than the gift of of uh, teaching or uh, apostleship in the sense that one is a more passive recipient of uh, the revelation that is given, in my understanding, the gift of prophecy is something spontaneously given to someone, which I, Wayne Grunham and I, I think this, we agree on that. Mm-hmm. You receive a prophecy spontaneously. Now, I don't know if I, I don't know if it's clear that children have that gift. Maybe they did. But I, yes, I don't, I think because of the way the gift operated, Yes, I think there were times, I mean, how often, we don't know, but that women spoke authoritatively in the assembly as prophets. And that the, what they said was to be obeyed, whether uh, or, or it laid the doctrinal and behavioral foundation. Now, I don't think that, now some people would disagree with this, but I don't think that compromises complementarianism because, because it, the nature of the gift is the reception of spontaneous revelation, and it isn't an office like apostleship and teaching. So that doesn't, you know, that doesn't trouble me that women women could speak thus uh, in authoritative ways. So when I think Philip's daughter spoke, I don't think that contradicts that they, they weren't pastors. So, mm-hmm. you know, Gordon Wenham has an article the famous Old Testament scholar, I'm sure you know his name, and he, and Gordon Wenham says, women did not function as priests in the Old Testament, but they did function as prophets. So I think we have the same issue in the Old Testament. Women, women did not function as priests, the settled authority in the congregation, but they did function as prophets. And in the Old Testament, when women functioned as prophets, their words were authoritative. Now, maybe they exercise that gift somewhat differently. The, the, you, you think of Huldah uh, or Deborah. At least people came to them for the word. I, I mean, it's hard to say. We have so little information. So I, I would say, yes, the words of their prophets were authoritative, even if they're women. And no, I don't think that contradicts complementarianism because I think the way they exercise that gift is different from the way an apostle exercises his gift or a teacher exercises his gift. Excellent. Well, hey, again, thank you. We, we got to get to the point where we're doing closing thoughts. Me and Michael are like fighting, like we, we've got to, we've got to ask one more. We've got to ask two more. Uh, uh, but, but I, we, we've got to, to wrap this episode up. Sure. I, I really want to have you back on Dr. Schreiner. If you'd like to come back, oh, I've got, we've got so many more questions to toss your way. Uh, you know, actually, I love it because, you know, I love, I'd learn, I'd learn from questions and you guys ask great questions. So well, that, you. that helps. Yeah. Me. Well, I think that, uh, Ephesians two twenty and first Corinthians 13 are the centerpieces yeah. of the entire debate. And yeah. we spent a fraction of time on them. That's right. So yeah. it sounds like you're open to a part two. So maybe here in the next few weeks or whenever you get some time, uh, we could do a part two and really zero in on those two texts. I think they're the, the two most important question, uh, texts for this whole conversation. 
Excellent. So what I'd like to do right now is we'll kind of do some closing thoughts. I'll ask uh, Michael to give his closing thoughts. Uh, and then Dr. Schreiner, we're going to toss it over to you and you can kind of give some closing thoughts. It's kind of like a like that little nugget that you want people to walk away thinking about as they're considering uh, the gifts of the Spirit, as they're reading Scripture as one of those nuggets. And, and we should probably, uh, you know, talk about all the gifts that you do believe in uh, as well. We probably should have had time for all of those things. Uh, uh, what, what do you not uh, believe? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. because we, we just spent enough time to, to really touch on those, you know, those really really sensitive ones. You can go pick up Dr. Schreiner's book, and I'd really encourage you to go do this uh, because we, we encourage our audience to read diversely and to check out different resources and and really pray and ask the Spirit to lead you uh, in this process as you're uh, reading the scriptures. So uh, we'd ask you to go pick that book up. Uh, it's, it's called Spiritual Gifts by Dr. Thomas R. Shiner. So uh, go check those out. Uh, and that'd be, uh, you can pick it up on Amazon, you can pick it up on Audible, you can pick it up at your local bookstore. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna toss it over to Michael. Give me your closing thoughts and then we'll talk, toss it over to Dr. Shiner uh, for his thoughts. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you were kind of touching on my closing thoughts, which was part of it was going to be by his book. Uh, I'm even saying that to our largely continuationist audience and it's not just continuationist, but, um, but we do need to read diversely. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Schreiner, I learned from your book. I gleaned from you uh, and really appreciate your tone. And, uh, you know, especially back in the 90s, and it's still around a little bit uh, today, there was such a thing as, again, it's still around a little bit, but militant cessationism. And uh, and you know what? There are militant continuationists, too. And I just think that's a not very Christian approach. That's and, true. Um, and just love the way you display the fruits of the Spirit and the way that you talk about meaty things. And so uh, I think my, my encouragement would be read diversely, learn from cessationists as well as continuationists, and let's display the fruits of the Spirit as we interact with people who think differently than us. Uh, Dr. Schreiner, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Well, I, I would just say it was great. I, I love you guys' spirit. I, I, I love the conversation, and it was really fun. And, I yeah, I'd like to come back, and maybe we'll do a part two sometime. That'd be fun. Okay. Excellent. Well, I'd like to get that on the books. Uh, for those of you who are watching, man, you enjoyed this episode. Uh, what I'd ask you to do is there's a couple of ways uh, that you can support our ministry. Uh, you can go uh, make sure to subscribe and, and like the video, first of all. Uh, that helps us get this content out there. If you enjoyed the video, maybe share it with some of your friends. Uh, but, but in addition to that, if you want to support our ministry and help us produce content like this, there's some links in the descriptions where you can kind of financially partner with us. Uh, you can give a PayPal link that's in the description. You can give on PayPal as a one-time gift or uh, you can give on Patreon as low as five bucks a month to get extra content. Y you better bet your sweet bippy that we're going to be watching this video again on Patreon. And me and Michael are going to give our thoughts on, on this and, and on that just because we didn't have enough time to do it here in this video. So really enjoyed uh, the interview. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, we're going to get uh, Dr. Trenner booked very soon, uh, at least in my hopes. I don't know what he's available. I'm like, yeah, it's <laughs> great. We're going to do another one tomorrow. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're really excited uh, to get him back on the show. So make sure to subscribe so you get the follow up for the part two when it does eventually come out. Anyway, blessings guys, and we'll see you tomorrow as we talk about a Christocentric view of the gifts of the Spirit. It's going to be really exciting. Blessings guys.